bit about the, um, the approach. It's not very complicated. Um, but I'm going to start by talking about why you want to do this stuff. And so most organisations know what they do. We're a hospital, we treat patients, get that. Every organisation knows that. Some organisations know how they do it. But very few organisations can articulate why they do it. And so when I, what I mean there is, you know, I always think back to myself as a rather mischievous staff nurse working in the middle of Birmingham. If someone spoke nonsense, I just used to think, I don't get it. It just sounds like nonsense. So when you're thinking about this stuff, is think about your why. What's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your inspiration? If you're a manager and you think you're going to inspire people by saying we have a new project initiation document or we need to do this because we've got a CIP, I guarantee you behind your back you've got someone like me as a staff nurse in the early 90s doing a big uh, something or other behind your back. Think about that. What's your why if you want to inspire people? And what I've noticed with Kettering, they had a new chief executive called Simon Walden, who a lot of people know from his national role. Um, but what I noticed there was they started to get the why. And this is a great tweet by Simon, which talks about the importance of time. The feedback from the, re from the relative of a patient that talks the importance of time. When you have a life-limiting illness, each moment becomes precious. Waiting a minute feels like 10. Waiting 10 minutes feels like half an hour. And waiting half an hour feels like an eternity. That's probably more in the why space. Because, uh, you know, we know that urgent emergency care a crowded emergency department uh, links to increased mortality. We know that outliers, there's an association with increased mortality. We know that if you reduce bed occupancy, uh, you'll save lives. We know that, you know, 48% of people over 85 die within one year of hospital admission. We know all that stuff, but think about your why. And the Long Stay Wednesday process is really focused here, right at the back end, and the process itself was created by, created by Mrs. Liz Sargent, the shy retiring therapist. <laughs> um, and part of this guide, if you look at page 29 to 32, it's really, really clearly documented. And Liz first tested this out in a hospital in the East End of London and got some pretty impressive results. And every time we've seen it implemented in the way that Fiona and the team in Kettering have implemented it, um, we're sort of seeing the same results, very similar to what Liz did where she uh, created it. The approach is really, really simple. An uh, experienced team visits the ward once a week at a predetermined time. The nurses are pulled off the ward. Is anyone here from a nursing background? When you were a nurse working on the ward, did you enjoy being pulled off the ward? No, no. Uh, but the team visiting should be something like a senior manager, Someone from the intermediate care team, uh, maybe someone from the discharge team, a social worker, senior therapist, a matron, and the most important person, an administrator who stays with the team every single ward that they go to with a laptop. And the reason for that is they complete the spreadsheet, which is incredibly easy to complete, put the ESIS code in it, but more importantly, who's going to do what next? And there's actions for the ward team, and there's actions for the visiting team, and there may be some actions which need to be escalated, but those actions go out within two hours of the visit. So the big thing here is it's really clear, if you're the ward team there, you're gonna get your actions in two hours, and the expectation is you're gonna do this stuff by tomorrow. If you're the visiting team here, you're gonna get your actions by the end of the day or within two hours, and the, uh, the hope is you're gonna do all your stuff uh, within two days. If not, it'll be escalated to the likes of Fiona, and then she'll uh, sorted out. So basically what you're doing is you're um, closing the loop very, very quickly. Questions for the ward, for the team visiting the ward. Does this patient genuinely need to be in an acute hospital bed? What exactly is the patient waiting for next? So they're waiting for social, is meaningless. Uh, they're waiting for OTPT, get a life. You know, they are not actions, are they? What needs to happen to make this day a green day for this person? I love the last presentation. Everyone has over-industrialised red to green days, haven't they? You know, what's a red day? A red day is a day when not everything that should happen to a patient should happen. Why can't this patient go home? Why not today? And the biggest thing of all is, is there a really clear plan in the patient's notes that includes 
clinical criteria for discharge. We all love John Day's presentation, but clinical criteria, which includes physiological and functional stuff, and as important, does the patient and their loved one know about the plan? And then the administrator collects all of this and sends the actions out. So what we've done at Kettering isn't anything special. We're just a standard DGH, but we've made things very different for our patients. So how did Long Stay Wednesday start? We had a made event where lots of people came and said, we've got hundreds of patients, no exaggeration, over day 21. And the feedback from our ward teams was, we have made it so complex. The wards dealt with patients over seven days a week, over seven days. I went and did a meeting on Thursdays for our long stay patients over day 21, and we were taking people off the wards. They felt they were spending the whole time getting ready for the next meeting or filling in checklists for things like red to green. And we'd actually disempowered our ward teams. So we made the decision on our May day, we would stop all meetings to do with flow for the next week, and we would visit the teams the following Wednesday. So we were enabling and releasing the ward teams to deliver the care they felt they could and would deliver. We started a bit of a social media movement on this. Everybody was motivated because they felt they weren't coming to meetings. So we got some various blogs, we were supported by our executive team to do this, and it was very much the Twitter campaign. So you can see we had our chief execs sign off before we started, so we started on the 8th of August, and from the 1st of August, there were quite constant tweets. That's just the team on day one, it's not the best photo, but what it does show from day one is we've had therapists and AHPs involved. We have not done a long stay Wednesday without senior therapists and also somebody from the council and either myself or the deputy director of nursing and our head of discharge. We have all bought into that. On the video, you heard how everybody said it was a long day. We've basically given up probably 20, 25% of our working week to this. But the results for our patients and their families have been phenomenal. So the sort of tweets we've seen is, um, after day one, one of the wards said, actually, they hadn't been doing criteria-led discharge. They were going to start to, to do it. They just never bothered, even though there were things in their notes. <laughs> and there's some photos of the team. And as you can see, the top one alone had 25 likes. This was happening. All of the wards were tweeting and buying into it. By week two, the, one of the wards has already devised a checklist of the questions. So we asked the questions that Pete said in a standardised way, and it was like they were ready for us. They'd got their answers. They knew what was happening with their patients. And also we have things on Facebook. What that shows, the whiteboard, was MAU a couple of um, weeks ago, when on a Friday night, over 50% of the ward was empty. We had 50% of empty beds in our urgent care areas going into a weekend. And this, you probably can't read it, but what it says is, I've heard um, good news about Long Stay Wednesday and the hard work you put into discharge in our super-stranded patients. So this was from one of our MAU sisters. And then she's put at the bottom, such amazing capacity for the middle of October, we might just about survive winter. So in our organisation, I'm going to show you the results in a minute, there's a huge buzz, there is so much energy. We're sitting with empty beds and we've got flow. We've also got people into the right beds, and I'll come to that in a minute because that's really, really important. So we've done Twitter and Facebook. So this is our results, I'll tell you how in a minute. We had in July, nearly 200 super-stranded patients. I'm really proud to say last night I had 115. When we started this on the 8th of August, we had 11 patients over day 100. Last Wednesday I had one and he was leaving the next day. Well, how we have done this is through consistency, challenge, but partnership working. So I'm really fortunate now that on a Wednesday, we phone a friend. If we haven't solved it, we phone the CCG and say, can you fund this, can you do that? So we're making differences 
for patients. So we've had some end of life patients that we've got delivered that day, uh, delivered, discharged that day. If we hadn't been there, they wouldn't have been because we challenged the status quo. We've made things really different. Not only have we decreased our number of super stranded patients, we have also as a trust decreased our bed numbers. Not many people can say that <laughs> go in October. We've actually closed off-site beds that weren't the appropriate place to have the patient. They're in a nursing home and actually we've got them to where they need to be. We've also ring fenced an elective orthopaedic ward which means our RTT performance has increased this month phenomenally and we've made sure the right patients are in the right place. How many people have got medical outliers today? I'm really proud to say we haven't got any. And that's by getting things right for the patients early in their journey and as working as an MDT. I wouldn't say it's easy, it's been really difficult, but we've kept at it and we've been consistent. So every Wednesday from the 8th of August, we've done this as a team and we will continue to do so. Interestingly, our results match what some of the speakers have said this morning, that when you start this, you let your super stranded numbers do go up. And they did, but then they've come right down. And also, our over seven day patients have come down as well. People are now saying to me, how much more can you do? Can you get this to below 100? If I'm honest, probably not. But I remember having a meeting with our chief exec when we were nearly 200 and committed to reducing it. And we, our target from NHSI was 141. And I'm thinking, how on earth do we do it? We're actually 18% better now than that by just concentrating on getting things right for the patient. It's not rocket science, we haven't done anything special, but we've just been consistent and we've challenged each other. However, the wood ED performance hasn't totally gone the same way. And I met with the ED team last week and it's very interesting. They didn't think we would be able to maintain this. They, they were like, it's a, a nine day wonder. We're going to have queues of patients again. And now they're like, oh, the focus is on us. And it is, because we can consistently deliver beds now. So now we need to do other things to make our ED flow better for our patients. So what's my top tips? It's a simple approach. We said we would do it one week, we did it the next. If somebody asked me for a PID, any documents, I do not have any. We literally went for it. There was no bureaucracy. There was no send it to a management committee. It was just something we said we would do. We cleared our diaries and we got on with it. And people trusted us to do that. It takes time to embed. On week one, we only saw 61 patients because it took that long to get the question, people into the momentum of the questions. We now see about 130, 140 patients a week. Pete said about getting the spreadsheet out in two hours from the wards. We do it in real time now. As we leave the wards, they know what their actions are and we know what ours are. MDT is key, not only on the visiting team, but on the ward teams. We always, from day one, had therapists and nurses, but we very rarely got medics. Most wards we now get medics. The reason why I've seen a difference and I can think of a junior doctor a couple of weeks ago on one of our wards. She was asked by her consultant to come in and she said, I don't know why I'm here, it won't help me. So we took a different approach and said, what patients can we help you with? She then stayed to discuss all of their patients because they realised it's added value. The other thing is about being flexible. We've changed the timings of who we see when on a Wednesday to support the wards because they said, if you come early, the consultant wants to join this. So we have flexed it around to make it better. But we, what is lovely, if a nurse can't attend and explain to patients, the therapists do, and there's that peer challenge. Also, therapies challenging each other. We don't do any um, home visits anymore for any types of assessments. They just do not happen anymore. And that's an output of saying, why are you doing that? Why is that patient not going home today? It's about communication. We didn't need to communicate yet. I didn't need to do anything with our comms team because our teams were already doing it. They were excited, they weren't going to meetings, and they were seeing a difference for their patients. The wards do need to be fully involved, 
and also they know when you're coming. So if we turn up early, they're like, we're not ready for you. So we do try really hard to stick to our timetable. And we try to be as consistent as possible. However, we do deviate. We've had a time where we've had some complex patients and on one patient we even brought into the meeting to discuss their discharge because they were so complex and didn't want to go home and felt that we were their place of safety, they were going to stay indefinitely. So we actually brought that patient in at the end of the meeting and talked with them about their options. Also the visiting team can change. You either get myself as Deputy Ku, Deputy Director of Nursing or the Deputy Medical Director. There's normally two of us um, senior and we always make sure we're invested in this. We learnt very on as a senior team, we were the ones who weren't closing the loop. The wards were doing all their actions, we weren't. So we now do a huddle on a Friday of all the actions that we said we would as a senior team. The sort of things we've done as actions is we've changed the way we deal with our out of county patients. So we deal with four different lots of social services teams. We've totally changed the way we work with our Rutland patients because of the um, information we were seeing on Long Stay Wednesday. The other thing is that it's about ch shaping future commissioning intentions as well. So we know where we haven't perhaps got the right pathways in the system currently. For example, our dementia and delirium team. So we're working with the CCG to see how we can do that differently going forward. So we always start with, does this patient need to be in an acute hospital bed? And they're like, no. And they're like, okay. So what are we going to do? Why are they still here? Clear plans are key. And it's also knowing what the next step for that patient is. Because especially initially, it's very embarrassing to say, but actually we quite often wrote there was no plan because nobody could articulate for us a clear plan that everybody agreed on for the patients they can now. It's also about linking it with red to green and not seeing this as something as new as onerous. And why not home? Why not today? So if somebody's going home tomorrow, we challenge for today. Also, if we notice themes or trends, we do something about it. So there's a care <coughs> home last week whose lift had broken and we've got three people waiting. So we, um, so we, we literally ran them that lunch time and said, if we get the ambulance service to do a risk assessment to bring patients up the stairs, they were going into be um, bedded solutions anyway, will you accept those patients? And if we hadn't put that level of challenge in, those patients wouldn't have been discharged. So it's about making it simply and empowering the ward teams to do it different. We have some amazing patient stories. I'm going to finish you off. We had a, um, finish off with a couple. We had cu um, we had three couples in last week, but we had a couple who were on two separate wards, hadn't been re reunited for about three weeks, and we actually managed through understanding through Long Stay Wednesday that we got them to the same care home because they both needed a better solution together. So we actually re reunited them because we'd identified them in different places and worked with the council to get them um, reunited together. So there's lovely stories like that about making it right for patients, not wasting patients' day and um, time, which is precious. I think Fiona and the team over there deserve a bit of a clap for that. Uh, I know I'm a bit over in time, but just in terms of this process, there's nothing particularly complicated that Fiona's talked about. So uh, myself and Lisa and Annie supported Kettering, but they basically mobilised this within about a week or two. And I know they said 95% performance is variable, but they've gone from being an 80 percenter to a consistently 90 percenter. Mm. Um, and I know you said you didn't think you could get below 100, but your team over there said, first thing they said to me, I'll tell you what, Pete, we're gonna get this below 100. You just wait and bloody see. So just to warn you, a couple of key things that come out, just learning from our experience of this and building on some of the other presentations. What we find with the Long Stay Wednesday process, or whatever you want to call it, is not every patient has a plan in their notes. I know that doesn't sound very interesting, but this is the type of plan which is good enough for every patient. This is for a COPD patient. Treat with oxygen to maintain SATs of 88 to 92%, nebulised bronchodilators, oral PRED, for follow-up with the acute respiratory hospital and home team, Clinical criteria for discharge, able to maintain SATs without oxygen, physiological, functional, able to manage the toilet, able to mobilise 10 yards, expected date of discharge, 11am, 4th of July. 
Independence Day. So one of the things, and you won't think this is very exciting, why don't you go and have a look how many patients of yours have a plan which is as good as that. It costs nothing, it just costs a biro. Uh, and I think what you'll find is lots of plans which say for OTPT, for social, for things like that. It costs nothing, it just costs momentum. Like you could see here when Fiona was speaking, you could feel she's got a sense of social movement. Uh, and what they've done there is they've put it in the hands of many. And you, some of you may have heard us talk about these four questions, but I'll just finish off with these. In terms of every single patient and or their loved one, again, it costs nothing. There's probably going to be some comms will come out from NHS England over the winter. But just ask yourself this, if you're a loved one or you're in a hospital, these are things that every patient or their loved one should know. Do I know what is wrong with me or what's been excluded, which takes a senior decision maker? Do I know what is going to happen now, later, today or tomorrow? What do I need to choose? What do I need to achieve to get home? And don't talk to me about being back to baseline. It means nothing. Tell me in my language what I need to achieve. And if there's no necessary delays, when can I expect to go home? No one ever argues with these four questions, the likes of health. Watch, I've never presented to an audience where someone says that's a load of nonsense. Most complaints from patients, if you study them, uh, will be because patients or their loved ones don't need these. Put them in the hands of many. If I'm a HCA, and I'm looking after John today. Think about that, John. <laughs> Not too much. But, you know, I can actually say to you, this is what's going to happen now. We're going to walk you to the toilet today, John, because we banned the pan on this board. We're not going to use the commode. Uh, we're going to get you dressed. The doctor's going to come and see you about 11 o'clock. Uh, hopefully, later on today, you're going to have an x-ray, and then, you know, hopefully you're going to be discharged tomorrow. Put these questions in the hands of many. But the biggest thing from Kettering is, do you know what they had? Uh, Kettering, no offence guys, but you're not special, are you? Uh, really poor complex discharge process, your PDNA nonsense, uh, that type of stuff. But what they do have is high levels of self-efficacy. And self-efficacy isn't arrogance. You either believe you can or you believe you can't. And what I heard today when it came in is, I believe I can get to uh, below 100. And that's what they're displaying. But if you're interested in Long Stay Wednesday, page 29 to 32 of the guide, but if you want us to give you just one day to get it going, we're very happy to do that. Thank you very much. Okay.